Right, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today to talk about equity in inclusion in outreach. Um, I'm really glad that you've been able to join us. My name is Patty Debo. I am the president of Parsons TKO. And we're a consulting firm that works with mission-driven organizations of all sorts on their fundraising, outreach, any sort of external communications they do. We do work with strategy, data, technology enablement, um, and are excited to talk to you about this topic today. Um, just a couple quick notes. Folks are muted and cameras have been turned off, but you should be able to ask questions in the chat, give some reactions and thumbs up if you like what's going on. Um, and also a note that we do have um, live transcriptions. So if you are in need of those, there should be a button at the bottom of the webinar screen for you to access that. Um, and also, if you're interested, we will be recording the session and distributing it to you afterwards. Um, so you'll get access to all the content and materials. That will get rolling. Right, I would love to know a little bit about who we have joining us today. And so we're gonna pop up a quick Zoom poll. Um, and as you all are filling that out, um, I'll give you a little bit of intro about myself. Um, so I'm, as I said, the president of Parsons TKO. I come from a background in both data and strategy consulting. Um, and in my role at PTKO, um, I oversee not only a lot of our internal operations and our staff, so I'm thinking about issues of equity and inclusion for our firm all the time. Um, but I also oversee a lot of our client work. Um, and part of that role, um, I have had a lot of conversations with clients recently who are talking about how to be more equitable and inclusive in their communications, their fundraising. Um, so those conversations have just spurred a lot of thinking about this topic. Um, and that was sort of the impetus for us wanting to have some content on this, have some conversations about this. Um, and hopefully you were able to also access the report that we've been building and compiling. Um, it's on the webinar sign up page <clears throat> and you can download it there, but it's also in its early forms. We are interviewing folks, pulling together resources and case studies, and we'll be continuing to release subsequent versions of that report and guide over time. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about it today, but also stay tuned. Um, if you have downloaded it and find it useful, there will be new versions forthcoming. Um, and it looks like the results are coming in. Uh, maybe we can publish those to the team, but it looks like we have a lot of folks that are in the communications or marketing function, um, some fundraising and other outreach functions, and then kind of a smattering of other folks across different organizations, um, and lots of folks in education, other nonprofit sectors, um, so yeah, quite a mix of folks today, but most folks kind of in some sort of outreach role, which is great, because um, that's the group that we want to speak to today. All right. So why another model for equity and inclusion? Um, you, you may have noticed in my introduction about Parsons TKO, we're not DEI consultants. Um, but as I said, I, I talk with a lot of our clients about this. And one of the things that I have noticed is folks that are in outreach functions tend to get a lot of pressure from their organizations, from their funders, from their stakeholders to be thinking about and acting on issues of equity and inclusion. Um, and one of the things I hadn't seen a lot of was some frameworks and thinking about um, why that is, how outreach folks can work with other parts of an organization um, in ways that are more holistic. Um, and certainly there's tons of resources out there and, and we'll get to some of those about tactics for how to do kind of equitable communications in terms of language or outreach or what channels you're using. Um, but I hadn't really seen a lot of holistic thinking about why that is and how it fits into an organization. Um, so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask some folks first, have you ever heard anyone in your organization say something like this? Um, you know, our supporter list is too white, it's too US centric, it's too something. Um, maybe you have donors who are all in a certain demographic and something I have heard over and over again from, um, you know, from folks in uh, fundraising or advancement is that, you know, they often have, depending on their cause, a lot of older, wealthy, often white um, women or sometimes men that are their donors or their major donors. Um, maybe you're trying to reach a whole new category of folks with your um, particular channels of outreach. Maybe your events are drawing a homogenous group. 
Um, I'm willing to bet some folks have uh, heard that. You know, if you've heard something like it, feel free to throw it in the chat or give us a reaction. But it's something I know I've heard from a lot of folks in the um, in the nonprofit space. And so, as we thought about that, one of the questions I have been asking folks is, well, why do you want to do that? And you know, I think we all agree, at least in this little progressive corner of the nonprofit sector, that. DEI, or as we like to call it, IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, access, uh, Equity, and Accessibility, um, it's generally the right thing to do. Um, and there is a lot of pressure that gets put on external facing outreach functions to make sure we're representing to all of our stakeholders um, that we are considering these issues. But there's not often a really strong why behind that. And you know, folks have asked us, can we really do outreach work that is inclusive? Can we bring a racial justice lens to it? Um, and the answer is always yes. But one of the things we talk with our clients about is, well, why or what are you hoping to achieve from it? Because you know, from my perspective, um, broad platitudes can kind of feel reductive to folks in underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I think about that as a woman myself, as a queer person, I never want to be sort of targeted solely because of those identities, right? I want to be um, in engaged with organizations or companies that I interact with because they have something relevant for me. Um, and so we want to really avoid that kind of tokenization of, of individuals or of big demographics. Um, but how do we get to the underlying why behind what we're doing? So one of the, the biggest, broadest things that I have heard from folks is we just want a more diverse audience. Um, and this was sort of the impetus for a lot of the thinking we've been doing around this at Parsons TKO recently. Um, we've got a blog post on this topic in particular that um, I think one of my colleagues will share in our chat. And you know, our first instinct is that really, if you want to reach a more diverse audience, the strategies and tactics you should take are actually just good outreach tactics. Right? You really ought to have some specificity about who your audience is, and you ought to be thinking about how to get content that's really relevant to them. And you should be thinking about mobile first, because that reaches a wider range of people, and investing in the infrastructure that allows you to personalize your content. And of course, making sure your team is representative of who you want to reach. Um, so these sorts of tactics are probably tactics you're already taking, regardless of who you're trying to reach but they struck us as things that are particularly important if you're trying to expand or diversify the audiences that you reach as well. Um, so I wanted to take a little quick diversion to talk about this particular example of diversifying your audiences, because even after we scheduled this webinar, it's kind of serendipitous. We have what I think is one of the best examples of an organization doing this that I've seen in a really long time, which is the Library of Congress and Lizzo. Um, and if you have been at all on social media in the past week to week and a half, you have probably seen this just about everywhere. Um, if you haven't, I'll give you the really brief summary, which is that um, the Library of Congress and Carla Hayden, who's the Librarian of Congress, tweeted at Lizzo a couple weeks ago about coming to play their unique and historical flute uh, collection. And if you don't know, Lizzo is also a classically trained flautist. Um, Lizzo responded, Lizzo visited the Library of Congress, and the Library of Congress showed up at Lizzo's concert here in Washington, DC, where I'm based, um, and was lucky enough to be at that concert, which was really fantastic, and that's where that picture in the bottom right is from. And she played James Madison's Crystal Flute at her concert in DC. And there has just been a flurry of social media activity about this um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, if you're curious to sort of how this uh, kind of exemplifies what we're talking about here. Um, I actually wrote a very long kind of ranty thread on LinkedIn about it. Um, someone will share the link to that in the chat. I encourage you to go look it up. But the gist of it is that one of the things the Library of Congress was doing, and I don't know if it was intentional, was really um, doing some of these impressive tactics to expand their reach. Um, and I don't know for certain, but I've got my sort of like rough representation here of what I think um, the Library of Congress and Lizzo's Twitter, follow Twitter followers overlap might be. Library of Congress um, about a week or so ago had roughly 1.2 million followers. Lizzo had 2 million. I would be willing to bet that other than some, you know, nerdy DC government types like myself who live in DC and also love Lizzo's music, there probably wasn't a lot of joint overlap in their follower bases. 
So they were instantly accessing by having Lizzo retweet their content, a really large uh, new supporter base. And if you unpack this a little bit, there's a lot of really interesting tactics within it. The first and most important of which is that representation matters. So president Obama, who was our first black president, appointed Carla Hayden as the first woman and the first African-American to become the librarian of Congress. I don't know if that had anything to do with them selecting this for Lizzo or if this idea came from their social media team, but the fact that Carla Hayden tweeted it and it didn't come from the Library of Congress account itself probably mattered a lot in terms of the um, sort of validity of engaging a particular audience. The other important tactic is they found a trusted and influential partner who was already followed and trusted by a brand new audience. They weren't simply putting out content and trying to force it to a new group of people that wasn't familiar with the Library of Congress. Because it's interesting, if you look back, the LOC account had actually tweeted about their flute collection the same day Carla Hayden did. But the strategy was very different. That one was very focused at their core followers. It was sort of a little bit niche, very much about the history versus the much lighter tone and outreach approach of what Carla Hayden tweeted. The other thing that they did was they tried new channels. They actually sent Library of Congress staff and um, probably some security to the concert who appeared on stage at Lizzo's concert. I'm not sure that the Library of Congress necessarily has a, a history of appearing at popular musicians' concerts, but that was a really interesting new outlet and channel for them that of course played a lot back into their social media strategy. Um, and then they also had some really great follow-up plans. When you're engaging a new audience, the, the last thing you wanna do is get a lot of attention from folks and then they realize, oh, actually all this organization is doing is putting out content that has nothing to do with music. Um, but they had this really great follow-up plan for immediately the day after the concert, they had held back some content, which was really wonderful footage of Lizzo visiting the Library of Congress and playing a variety of different instruments. Um, and so that was released the following day, kind of sustaining that engagement. And then they also had this plan for long-term engagement, where one of the things that they did in the days following the sort of viral explosion of this content was they started to point people to other things in the, their collections that were related to music or maybe more popular culture interests. They talked about their other musical instrument collections. They talked about their comic book collections and just other things that are probably much more um, tangentially related to an audience who may have come to find the Library of Congress via music. Um, and so there's a lot more we could say about this. Um, please go find the LinkedIn post and I'd love to hear what your reactions to this were. But the punchline of it is it really worked. And you know, TBD internally at the Library of Congress, whether they'll sustain this engagement, but in the week, if you compare the week before this incident to the week after, um, they just had staggering results. And, and thanks to my colleague, Nikki Oreggio, who really helped with some social listening analysis on this. I mean, it may be a little bit small to see on this screen, but if you can't read the numbers, um, in that one week period, their average likes per post was up 1,500%. Their average retweets was up 540%, and their average engagements on their Twitter feed was actually up nearly 2,000%, which is just staggering. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting example um, of an organization that kind of took to heart, we want to reach a new audience. We really want to diversify who we're reaching and maybe do that with a bit more of an inclusive mindset than we might have if we only used our traditional channels. Um, so just one example, and we'll come back to um, a, a couple other examples later in the conversation. All right, so we're going to take a couple of breaks through this um, webinar because I want everyone who's with us today to be thinking about how to put it into practice at your own organization. And as I mentioned early on, one of the most important things is to really be clear about your goals and your why. Um, and one of the ways we like to think about goals at PTKO is in this kind of two-part format of saying, I want to do one thing so that I can achieve something else or you know, reach a new audience. And so we try to think about this format. It really can help you to um, articulate why you wanna do something in the right-hand side of this table, because people often stop at the left-hand side of, this is what I wanna do. And so, you know, following with this Library of Congress example, 
I don't know if this is what they were thinking, but they might have thought, I want to engage more BIPOC or communities of color supporters on social media. If that had been their goal, that's great. But part of it is the why, right? If you don't have content that's relevant for that audience, or you're not sure why you're engaging them, these sorts of efforts can really fall flat. And again, I'm hypothesizing here about what their social media team might have been thinking, but they might have thought, well, I want a better feedback loop on our content and programs. They're the Library of Congress. Their constituency is all of America. And so if they don't actually have a representative group of followers, that's a pretty biased feedback loop. And so if they're really looking to have ongoing engagement and conversations with their social followers. It's a really good why for wanting to expand and diversify their reach. But if we think a little bit more broadly about other things that fundraising and um, communications professionals might have goals for, there's a lot of things um, that you might want to do. And so I encourage you to, if you've got a piece of paper with you, grab a, a piece of paper, write down some ideas. You may even have some goals in mind already of what your team is trying to do, but I encourage you to try to articulate that second half of it so that I can do what. So you may have a goal on your fundraising or advancement team to transition low dollar donors into monthly giving. Why are we doing that? Typically it might be because we have more stability in our annual fund or in our revenue streams. Um, and that may be a way to have better ongoing engagement with a younger group, with a more diverse socioeconomic group of supporters. You may also, and, and this is an example that we've um, discussed with some partners of ours and we'll come back to later, let's say you work in the higher education sector and you may want to better engage your younger alumni. Um, well, why are you trying to do that? Is it just because you want them to give money? Well, it may be because you actually want them to become active alums, right? And, and there's a lot behind that. Maybe you want them to be mentors to your current students. And, you know, in a lot of institutions, the youngest alums are not the folks we think about as giving higher dollar donations, so they can become sort of a disengaged population. Um, but you may have long term goals of cultivating sort of a, a culture of philanthropy among this group so that when they are older and have more financial means that they're able to be higher dollar donors. You may just want them more active in your alumni community or your campus community. It's a lot of potential whys there, but getting crisp on that is important. You may also be thinking about internal things you want to do, for example, implementing DEI training for your um, communications team or your fundraising team. Um, well, why are you doing that? Is it just because someone in the leadership of your organization said so or because you want to be able to say that you did it? Um, you know, I, I think it's great when people are doing this, but understanding why and how you're going to put that into practice is also critical. And so one example of a why um, could be that you want to improve awareness of your biases so that when we are planning events or writing content, our team is um, very aware of your blind spots. Um, so I hope everyone has had a chance to kind of jot down some ideas. I would love for folks to kind of share some things in the chat if you're willing to. Um, if you've got some ideas of a goal that your team has or even one maybe you're struggling to come up with the why, um, please feel free to uh, share that in the chat. And thanks to Carrick, I did see your comments about having some um, advancement services folks in the room. That's fantastic. Um, hopefully some of you, maybe we met at the uh, AASP conference a couple weeks ago, um, but we will be coming back and talking a bit about what are some of the more operational um, things that maybe, uh, depending on your role in advancement services, that those teams can do as part of equity and inclusion as well. So thanks for highlighting that team. All right. Well, if folks are thinking about their goals, and again, please feel free to share those. I want to give a brief introduction to the full kind of model and framework that we're using to think about um, equity and inclusion in outreach. All right, so as I mentioned, kind of the motivation for this is that I've encountered a lot of folks who, you know, really are feeling a lot of pressure on their comms or fundraising team to kind of articulate to their leadership, to their funders or to others externally that they are, as I think of it, doing equity. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's a lot to unpack in that. But for me personally, I think about it as it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a journey. Right. I've interviewed a number of folks for this report and 
almost universally, one of the responses I get from folks if I ask about, hey, what are you doing with your team? Can I talk to you about how you think about equity and inclusion? People often say, we're actually not doing enough. We're not there yet. I don't know if what we're doing is really making a difference. Um, and that strikes me as this kind of checking the box sort of thinking around um, equity and inclusion, as if there is a destination we will get to. Um, I hope we can reach a, a point in our society where everything feels equitable, but my guess is that's not really achievable in the lifetime of any of us here today, but it is a practice and a journey that we should all be working on. And so, um, you know, the fact that the pressure is coming to the outreach teams is challenging, but I think importantly, we want to give folks who work in those functions a framework for thinking about how do the things that you do as an outreach team um, kind of connect to what's happening internally at your organization with your operations and your leadership, as well as to the program functions of your organization, whether that be grant making or direct services or um, run an educational institution, whatever your program is. And so we've started to think about this model, you know, in these three big areas, but really there's kind of four categories of things that we think are areas where you can make impact. And we'll dive into a little bit more detail but one is the organizational practices of the funders, the nonprofits, and the vendors you work with, and how do all of those operate on a day-to-day -day basis internally. Then you have the goals and audiences, and who are you as part of your mission trying to reach? Are we very clear about the donors, the supporters, the members, if you're a membership organization, or the students? Who are we trying to have as, as part of our institution? Um, and what are our goals for engaging with them? And then there's all of the things that come with your outreach strategy itself, the platforms you're using, how they're configured, the channels you do outreach through, the tactics you use from your messaging to your graphics to all of the things that go in a great kind of outreach plan. Um, and then lastly, but of course not least, um, the programs that your organization implements and how those impact the community. And really that comes down to implementing your mission. And those are, of course, inextricably tied to your fundraising and outreach because they're great feedback loops and they're actually often similar audiences for a lot of organizations. I just wanna take a pause here and see, we've got a couple of folks who are sharing their goals. This is fantastic. Um, create awareness in younger adults so that you can increase younger adults in your donor base. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, and folks are asking about the sort of measurability of that, you know, I think that is really specific enough. Um, it's very tactical, it's very actionable, it's getting you a sort of broader and more diverse kind of base of donors. Um, and then you can think about it and as we go through this, hopefully it'll give you some more ideas. How can you actually um, you know, rethink how you engage with that folks so that that is a long-term meaningful form of engagement. So thanks, Patty, for sharing that with us. All right, and here's a, a brief overview, and I know it can be a little bit tricky to see some of that text, but hopefully you've downloaded the report. It's in there and you can kind of zoom in and out as needed. Um, but what this kind of view of it really does is really dives into each of those four areas with some very tactical places that you can examine for what uh, equity and inclusion practices you might want to adopt. Um, and how I hope outreach folks use this, and you'll notice here that the outreach functions are the ones that are more built out than the others, right? So very much kind of consolidated on the internal side is the one that says internal operations and practices. And there are whole kind of frameworks and models for how organizations can adopt more equitable practices across their HR and their hiring and recruiting, um, all sorts of other internal functions, the accessibility of their spaces, um, and that's kind of consolidated here because we are taking this from the perspective of outreach folks who want to be having conversations with their peers in these other arenas to say, hey, how does this impact the outreach that we're doing? Um, and so, you know, we don't need to go into too much detail there, but what I hope this helps you think about is if you have a goal, and hopefully everyone was able to write down at least one or two, um, you know, that you can think through each of these topics and say, what do we need to do differently? Because that to me is perhaps one of the most critical, although maybe most obvious pieces about trying to um, have more equity and inclusion, reach a more diverse group of folks is that you can't keep doing the same things and hope that something will be different. 
or hope that you are going to reach a new set of folks. And so this framework hopefully will help you think through how you might be able to do things a little bit differently um, in a variety of very tactical areas. I don't wanna to go too much into the detailed content of the report because I hope everyone has a chance to download it and take a look. But if you haven't yet, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the kinds of content that's in there. Um, you'll see some examples in the top right of this screen. There is one page in, in this report for every one of those dots that was on the, the slide in the framework that we just looked at. And each of those includes kind of some description of why we think it's relevant to doing more equitable outreach. Um, some questions and prompts for you to reflect on your own practices and where you might have areas of strength or not. Um, we are working on compiling a, a number of case studies of organizations that have really put into practice and operationalized some of these things into their day to day work. Um, and then we're also consolidating a whole lot of external resources. Um, you know, it would be very hard to compile everything into one document. And so we've really taken the approach here of pointing people to resources that if you decide the thing you need to work on is our content creation process or our content ops, um, there are plenty of external resources on how to infuse more inclusion into your content creation, messaging, language. And um, so we're just trying to aggregate those for folks all into one place here. The other thing that's included in this report, and this is where we're gonna dive a little bit deeper as a group today, is some templates and worksheets for you to actually you know, think through this at your own organization and to take some of those goals that you may have jotted down and start to come up with some actions and plans that you can discuss with your colleagues. So there's some blank templates and some suggestions for how you might engage in this conversation with your teams internally. Um, I will call out here and, and probably will do so multiple times again that um, we are on a sort of version one of this report and we are still engaging in lots of conversations with folks, collecting a lot of resources. So I would love if folks reached out um, you know, we've got our emails here in this deck. I'm just Patty at Parsons TKO. Um, but please feel free to reach out. I would love to talk to folks and hear what you're doing. I would love you to share ideas of resources that you've loved that we could include here. Because um, almost every time I talk to someone, I, I hear of one or two more. And it's great to sort of have this be crowdsourced. All right, and here's just one example, a little bit um, of a, a deeper dive into what one of those pages might look like in the report and uh, it might be channel selection. And if you're trying to reach a new group or achieve a goal, such as um, getting younger folks to be donors, as uh, Patty suggested in the uh, chat here, um, you may wanna use new channels to reach those folks. And as I mentioned earlier, I think this was an interesting one because I bet or hope that this is something the Library of Congress was thinking about when they were exploring um, how to reach a whole new group of folks with their Lizzo collaboration. And you know what we've done here is sort of just given some introductory text. Again, there's one of these for each of the areas in the um, report, um, but some prompting questions for you to think about, you know, what are you doing today that might be inhibiting you in terms of doing more equitable and inclusion and inclusive outreach or reaching the audiences that you wanna to get to. Um, so for example, are your channels fully accessible to folks and are there any barriers there? Um, if you're doing in-person events, what sort of considerations um, do you need to take into account, et cetera? Um, so in our Library of Congress and Lizzo example, they may have thought about the fact that, you know, they probably were pretty focused on digital channels and maybe kind of the in-person experience of their wonderful buildings here in Washington, DC. But I don't know if they had gone out before to sort of bring their content to other places where people are, such as a pop music concert. Um, so that was a sort of really interesting thing that if they had been using this model, they might've said, huh, yeah, maybe there are places where we can bring our content to where people already are. They may have also thought about how do we do this in a mobile friendly way? Now, of course, they were already very active on all the social media channels. Um, but if you're someone who works in communications, you definitely know that you know, the digital divide is real. People's access to broadband internet or to laptop or desktop devices is not as widespread as we might believe it is if we're people who work on those sorts of devices every day. Um, so mobile friendly is a, is a much better way to reach a broader base of folks. Um, so they were probably already doing that, but I think that was pretty critical to this campaign being very social media focused 
and most people are consuming social content on their phones. Um, and then the last thing is who are you excluding? And that's an interesting way to flip um, something like channels on its head and say, who's not kind of coming to our content? Um, if you've got this beautiful historic collection of ancient flutes that lives probably in a vault somewhere in the Library of Congress, anyone who doesn't come to Washington DC is not gonna see that. And if you're just posting about it on social media, they're probably not really getting to experience what that looks like. And so there's a bit of a sort of exclusion, not intentionally, just by nature of the channels that were being used before. So having this thing where Lizzo was able to come and do it and then speak to her experience, um, to her own followers and say, wow, this is incredible. I'm a musician and this is what I experienced. Um, she was really able to bring that kind of uh, tactical um, connection to their collections to a whole new group of people. Um, and having been at that concert, it was pretty powerful because she had this moment where she played the flute and she ended it by saying, um, we should all be grateful to the Library of Congress for preserving history. History is cool. And I just thought that's one of the most powerful things I've heard and, and probably the kind of uh, promotion that's really hard to get. So there's lots more like this in the report. Um, in this case, we've got a couple resources here for, you know, if you're interested in doing events and meetings, um, there are folks from the Center for Inclusive De Design that have fantastic resources for how to think about doing that resources on mobile first strategy, thoughts about accessibility and communications. Um, so these are the kinds of resources we're directing people to. Um, we hope that this content gets you thinking and then when you're ready to take action, you can use lots of these external resources to build your plan. So we're gonna dive a little bit into how you might put this into practice in your own organization. And this is one of the worksheets that's in the report. Um, it really is just the model with some, some blank spaces written on top of it. Um, and you know the way we hope people use it is to think about what your goal might be and write that at the top here. Um, and then you know there's a variety of different ways you could use this. One is to just brainstorm yourself, right? To sit down and say, if I want to you know, reach younger alumni or reach younger donors, um, as Patty mentioned in the chat, you know, what do I need to do differently in each one of these areas? Um, and you may use it to create a plan with a team, to sit down with a bunch of team members and really kind of hash out along any or all of these, what you might wanna do. You can also think about it as a little bit of an assessment. Um, where are you actually doing things well in, in uh, this particular framework? And where are you not that you might need to put some more effort or investment or resources towards? Um, and hopefully, I would love for this to facilitate conversations with your colleagues in programs, in internal operations or leadership about how important it is for those pieces to all align. Um, and I'm actually going to jump ahead a couple slides because I love that somebody um, talked about having uh, younger donors because that is an example we already had in here. Um, we had worked with a, a colleague of ours who has a history of working in the higher ed space and shared with us their example um, of, you know, how do they reach younger donors and younger alumni in particular at this institution. And their goal was to have longer term support from a historically underrepresented group of alumni that was actually much more diverse than their broader donor base because their younger alumni at this institution was more racially diverse, more gender diverse, had more LGBTQ individuals in it, um, and just all sorts of a range of diversity that their historical alumni and donor base did not have. Um, now we did this a little retroactively with them, but I think it demonstrates a bit how one might use this. Because in this case, and, and Patty, I hope you find this valuable since it's similar to your example, there was a lot that they did differently for this particular goal from what they did for the rest of their donor and alumni engagement. Um, and I wanna point out a couple things before I dive into the details here. Probably primarily is the fact that you'll notice there's not something in every one of these boxes. The goal is not to affect change in every single arena, but it's primarily to just get you thinking about where you might do things differently. Um, and so in this case, you know, there's a little bit um, of something in every category of operations um, outreach and programs. And I think that's also important. Um, sometimes depending on your role and your organization and how siloed it might be across teams, 
you may feel like your sort of realm of ability to make change is mostly within your outreach team, but that's okay. It's a great place to start. But I think the more you can engage your program teams and your internal operations to feel like there's a consistent and holistic approach across the organization to reaching this new group or achieving this new goal, um, the better. And so in this case, some of the things that this uh, university did was when they were trying to reach younger alumni and engage them as donors, they actually got a new funding source, particularly for that. And they had a, a board member make a matching donation. They also, and not everyone has these sorts of resources, but they were able to create a position on their team that was explicitly dedicated towards um, student and young alumni and engaging them as donors on the advancement team. And then as they were building out the campaign, they thought a lot about what their outreach team could do differently. Um, and particularly the history of engagement with this group was quite low. Um, so one of the things that they did was said, we really need to get peers engaged, sort of shift that history of how we engage with folks. And so they built out student committees to be the leads on the campaign instead of having, um, you know, someone who uh, was from the advancement office do it. They were very clear about who they defined as target audiences, and they thought current seniors who were about to graduate was the right group because they had them on campus to engage with but then they could convert them and build this culture of philanthropy very early on in their alumni journey. Um, they were very intentional about channels. Of course, as you can imagine, you know, younger folks, highly digital, but also doing on-campus events, which is not always something a fundraising team might be focused on um, if alumni are kind of spread out in different geographies. Um, for messaging and content creation, they really leveraged those student committees and had all of the communications in the voice of those students instead of coming from the institution itself. And then when they thought about what were the conversions they were targeting, if you're on a fundraising team, you probably know that you may have an average donation that you target, either for monthly giving or first time donors, you know, that may be what you choose to have on your website, a suggested donation. In this case, targeting a different and younger group, they lowered that amount. Um, and then when you think about what metrics you're using to define success for a campaign like this, um, this is pretty common, I think, in particularly, you know, student giving at universities, but also lots of, of nonprofits, is you're looking at a participation target instead of a dollar and up target. So it's very clear this would be different than, for example, a capital campaign or something where you've got kind of the thermometer and it's all about hitting this large number. In this case, it was all about hitting a participation amount. Um, and so that as a goal is very different than what the team might have traditionally done. And then in terms of programs, it was also important that they had really strong partnership with their alumni association so that this wasn't a sort of one and done type engagement with this community, that there was very intentional follow up with the alumni uh, association at this university so that they could continuously engage with these students who were first time donors. So I hope that helps you all get a sense of how you might use this. I'm going to jump back and suggest if there's anyone who has an example that they'd love to talk through. I think we actually have the ability to promote people to speakers. Um, so I don't know, I saw Patty and Naisha both chatting uh, in our chat today. If either of you is interested, feel free to pop your name in the chat there. Or if anyone else came up with a goal you'd love to talk through, we can do a little bit of a real time kind of exercise with this. Um, you know, feel free to put that in the chat. While folks are thinking on that, um, I will share another example. Um, and we're going to leave some time at the end um, so that if folks have questions, please start popping them into the chat. I realize we're starting to get towards the top of the hour here. So I'd love to hear what questions folks have, and, and we'll leave a little bit of time for that at the end as well. So here's another example. We're going to return to the Library of Congress um, and sort of think about if you were on the social media team there. Um, here is something that you might have done if you were thinking about how do I engage more um, BIPOC supporters on social media so that I get better feedback loops from them and uh, feedback on how we're engaging um, our content with you know, all of our constituents. So we talked about a few of these things before, but on the internal side, um, your team composition really matters. Representation matters. And as I mentioned, you know, it's hard to draw a direct line from President Obama to this viral social media campaign, but I don't think there's nothing there. I think the fact that we 
had you know someone who's a president who was our first black president who appointed historically the most diverse cabinet um, that we've had in this country in our federal government and that person is leading an institution that is probably thinking a little bit differently about who they engage and how um, that's really important and so you know that's not something you can retroactively change but it certainly demonstrates um, why that's critical and why Carla Hayden's voice is actually important here. I think it's really interesting that they chose to have the tweet to Lizzo come from Carla Hayden herself and not from the Library of Congress um, main account on Twitter. Then when you think about what the outreach function itself was doing, um, you know, there is, of course, the history of engagement in this community was probably pretty low. And so you needed to think about what that follow up was going to be. You know, if you go back historically in the Library of Congress's Twitter or other social media feeds, um, there's a lot of intriguing but fairly niche content. And so if you're going to try and engage a very new community of folks who maybe are very interested in popular culture or music, um, you need to be able to think about what that follow up content is going to look like. And as you followed their accounts over this past week, there was tons of great examples of that. Hopefully they were pretty clear about who their target audience was. And I'm just guessing, you know, based on who I saw at the Lizzo concert, it's a fairly young crowd. I was honestly probably on the older end of who was there. Um, it may have been a largely BIPOC community. I think there's a lot of LGBTQ community represented amongst her fan base. Who knows if they had an intentional target audience here, but I think it was probably very likely to be inclusive of those groups. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they also had a, a different channel for them. They brought the Library of Congress's collections to a concert, which maybe they've done before, but not in a place that I'd ever seen or heard of. Um, and then they also invited this celebrity to come to the Library of Congress building and use that as part of their campaign. So that's very different than just sort of the typical tweets about collections, you know, tweets about content that's just going to live on social media. You think about that messaging and content creation. Um, I also thought it was quite different the tone they were using. Um, you know, it was definitely uh, a much lighter tone, um, more emojis, more things like that. If you look at, um, it's an interesting exercise to even go look at the original post that the Library of Congress did about their collection of historical flutes compared to what Carla Hayden tweeted, and then compare it to what the Library of Congress was tweeting in the days after the Lizzo concert. Um, very different tone. They had a very particular hashtag, Lizzo at LOC, that was sort of all over their different channels. Um, and they were kind of using Lizzo's voice, right? She became the sort of person through which they were communicating. And this history is cool message um, was a very different tone than some of the really niche interest content that the Library of Congress was putting out. And intended conversions, um, I wonder in this case if it was uh, social follows. I don't know, this is something that's a little bit tricky for us to uh, sort of know what their goals were from the outside, but I did notice that just a couple of days ago, the Library of Congress tweeted a sort of welcome to their new followers with this sort of shrug emoji like, huh, we've got some more people around here than we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm guessing that was a target that they had which again, maybe is the same of what they've done before, but I also wonder um, if some of their core audience may be researchers, maybe people they're hoping go kind of explore content on their website or visit the library in Washington, DC. Um, so this could have had a very different set of intended conversions for the campaign. And then that thought about long-term community engagement, as I mentioned, it's already evident that they're trying to spur interest in related and tangential content, right? So other collections of music paraphernalia or musical instruments, other pop culture things like comics. Um, I think that those are really great tactics. And, and my guess is they were actually undertaking a lot more tactics than I was able to represent here, um, kind of looking at their campaign from the outside. So I hope these examples are helping folks think about how you might use it in your own organization. Um, I did see one question come through um, Q&A about, you know, what would be a good starter goal for an organization that's just getting started on their journey with equity and inclusion? Um, it's a great question. And it's, you know, of course, going to be highly specific to what your organization's mission is. 
um, and what you're trying to achieve. So I would suggest kind of looking at your organization's um, uh, kind of strategic goals. If you have overarching strategic goals for your organization and kind of drawing from those. Um, for example, if your organization has a goal of we want to you know, grow participants in our programs or we want to increase the number of visitors to our a cultural institution or grow enrollment at an educational institution. Um, thinking about that with uh, a lens of IDEA or DEI is a really great place to start. If you're thinking about growing, then what does inclusive growth look like? Um, that may be reaching a new audience. It may be, um, you know, uh, interacting differently with people that you haven't engaged with before. Um, the other lens I'd say for teams that are just getting started is, you know, as I mentioned, the hope is that your work can span across internal operations and your outreach teams, as well as your programs. Um, but oftentimes, if you're someone that's sitting on a communications, a fundraising, a membership team, you may not have the ability to sort of expand beyond um, what your team is doing. And we had a wonderful example um, when we did a similar session to this um, at a, a conference where we had someone who was a grants processor um, at a medical institution joined us and they had noticed that they had a donor who was a very low dollar donor, um, but was giving very regularly via a mailed in check every single week, um, small amounts of money. Um, and they were struggling to get the rest of their team to recognize that this person could be a really important ambassador and actually a really good channel um, to the community that that person lived in, which is not one where they drew a lot of donors from. So one of the things we talked about, and this might be interesting for folks in kind of a philanthropy ops or advancement services role, is well, what can you actually do? Um, you'll see there's some things on here about platform selection and configuration. What can you do inside your tools to have new configurations such that these sorts of donors can get identified or flagged in a way that may not be evident. Um, so we talked and brainstormed as a group with that person about, um, is there a new field that they need in their CRM or some sort of flag for, um, I think where we landed was calling it like a unique donor that may sort of be not coming, coming up in um, a wealth screening. They may not be coming up in a high donor category. Um, you know, they may not be sort of surfaced in any other way, but this person had a really compelling story and connection to the institution that at the very least might have been worth some personal outreach or that person could potentially become sort of an ambassador to reach some of their peers or it could have made an interesting story to share on their social media team. Um, so there was a lot of opportunities there, but where that person felt like they were able to start was, well, I'm a gifts processor. I work in our CRM. One of the things that I can do is work with our CRM team to make sure I have a way to identify these um, so that they're not lost. So I think finding those small things that are related to your role is also a great way to start. Um, and then kind of just having those conversations from there with your broader team. I hope that helps. Thanks for the question. Um, another one that came in via Q&A, um, should I work with other departments on my team's DEI goals and what's the best way to do that? Um, ideal world, Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the whole points of this framework is to really encourage um, how these things are kind of very intertwined and that it's much more powerful if your outreach functions are backed by really strong equity and inclusion practices internally. Um, one of the best examples that I can give, and there is no one institution I would mention because I have seen this in so many places where an organization is making a very concerted effort to do really inclusive um, external communications and to really highlight even a lot of the things that are happening internally at the org and how they're engaging with new communities. Um, and then they post job listings and the job listings don't have salary data attached to them. Um, and if you're someone who does any work in the HR function or reads at all about it, you'll know that research has just shown over and over again that that's one of the most uh, 
compelling things you can do to address salary inequities, particularly for women and people of color, is to make salaries transparent when you are hiring, such that people aren't rewarded for their negotiation skills. Um, but we have organizations where I'm sure the comms team or the fundraising team is doing really impressive work and reflecting what I'm sure is a lot of great work internally. And then here you have this other kind of very visible, very external thing that is just really not aligned. Um, so of course the ultimate goal is for all of these things to be working in, um, you know, kind of in line with one another. Um, if you're not already kind of doing that or having uh, direct lines of communication about those things. I hope that kind of thinking with a framework like this might make you um, feel empowered to facilitate some of those conversations and, you know, even go to some of your peers and say, hey, I have a goal to diversify our social media followers and I'm working on a plan for that. Here's what I'm going to need from our programs team and here's what I'm going to need from our internal operations. Um, or if you just know folks on those sides, I think bringing together the people that you do know is a really powerful kind of silo breaking effort. Um, one of the ways we like to work, whether it's on topics like this or anything else is through workshops and working sessions. And I think it's hard to understate the power of just bringing people from different departments together in one room to talk about something. Um, so one of the things I, I suggest doing is, you know, if you have a goal that you wanna work on, kind of bring this framework as guidance, but get in a room or get in a, a virtual kind of whiteboard environment like Miro or something like that, where you can kind of just sticky note brainstorm with colleagues from either different outreach functions, because frankly, sometimes there are silos between marketing team, a fundraising team, um, a membership team, but and engaging your colleagues um, from the programs team. Um, so I, I think, yes, absolutely, that's a great thing to do. Sort of how you do that it might be a little bit specific to your organization and your internal culture, um, but I'd always be happy to chat with folks more about that um, if you want to reach out. All right, I realize we are just getting to the top of the hour. Um, if folks have any other questions that you would like to kind of pop in the chat or in the Q&A, please do so. Um, you know, I will... Uh, kind of get to those if anything comes up immediately. But um, just while we're sort of wrapping up here and, and seeing if anything else comes through, just a couple of notes on next steps. Um, as I mentioned, if you did register, you'll receive a follow-up that has both the materials in this deck, as well as some of the other things that were shared in the chat today. Um, and we are still looking to chat with folks for interesting case studies, interesting ideas, just to brainstorm on this topic. You're welcome to reach out to me personally. My email is there um, or to anyone on our team to share a little bit about what you're doing. I, I'd love to hear. Um, and please keep in touch. Um, if you're not signed up for our newsletter, please do so because we're gonna be distributing an updated version of this report. Um, I've gotten some great feedback from folks in these conversations that I've had. And I actually even have some ideas about how to update the visual of this model. Um, one of the wonderful things that a couple um, folks I talked with at different nonprofits shared was the impression that this seemed like a, a journey um, that people ought to move through left to right. And, and I hope some of the examples made it clear that that's not the intent. So we may be tweaking the model a little bit, and I would absolutely love feedback from anyone who spent this time with us today thinking about it. Um, so please do keep in touch. Please take our free content, uh, visit parsonstko.com. We have a wealth of content on this topic as well as many others. Um, we've got articles, podcasts, videos, and of course, uh, continued events like this one. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It was great to have you with us. <laughs>